Hello everyone. So this week we're going to deal with the density experiment. Now luckily for us this is one where you've dealt with all the equipment before because it's relatively simple. Um, some of the mathematics of it are a little bit challenging at first but we can walk you through that. So this experiment has two basic parts. One density of irregular substances. One density of irregular objects. Um, when we have something that's irregular, we can't calculate its volume using a geometric formula the way we can for a cube or a sphere or a cylinder. We have to then deal with its volume by displacement. It's not particularly difficult. We basically take a very exact volume in a graduated cylinder of water. We drop our solid into it. The water level rises. That's the volume of what we put in there. And we repeat that, and then we graph it and the density is a slope. We have to take mass of our substances before we add it to the water because weighing it afterwards it's wet so our mass would be thrown off. So first we would weigh a sample then we would dump it into a very exact measurement of water and then we're going to repeat that a few times so we build up the data. So um, in the lab these are basically like copper and tin you know irregular spheres so they're basically like what are called copper shot. Um, they are a little bit bigger than your fingernail in diameter. Um, and so it's impossible to get very accurate amounts added at a time. You can't add one milligram at a time when your pieces are, you know, two or three grams each sometimes. But other than that, as long as it fits in a cylinder, we're okay. Now, a few things we do have to be careful with. One, weighing them out. First thing we do. Um, in the lab, we would normally do this in a plastic container rather than what we use for almost everything else is glass. The reason for that is people are relatively uncareful about things, and so it's not going to come as much surprise to you if you start dropping heavy metal objects into a glass container. Gee, I wonder what will happen. Hmm. I don't know. It's a mystery. It's going to break the thing. So... We typically have you use plastic beakers for this instead of glass ones, just in case you're a little less gentle than maybe you needed to be. Um, and we'll have you do it for multiple samples, and so then you're going to basically do the same procedure probably five or six times into the same volume of water. So you're going to end up overall adding, you know, let's say we're adding 10 grams at a time, so overall you're going to put in about 50 grams. But we're going to measure what happens with every exact amount we put in, volume wise and then we can graph it when it's over. We'll go through that in a moment. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is we kind of have to have an idea of volume. The smaller the graduated cylinder we use the better in terms of accuracy for the volume but these are relatively large pieces so using a 10 mil graduated cylinder really isn't going to work. So we're going to end up using either a 25 or specifically the instructions here say use a 50 mil graduated cylinder not because we need a large volume but because we need a large diameter to make the metal pieces actually go in there comfortably depending on the sample we chose. All right, so relatively simple. We take a graduated cylinder, we fill it probably about halfway, so somewhere around 25 mils just to start, get an exact number off of that. So first part of the data sheet will have a mass listed for zero grams. That is your reading for the volume of the graduated cylinder with nothing in it but water. That is that is before you've added any metal to it, just so we have that to subtract from all of our other data points so that we're talking about the volume of the metal only. Then weigh the metal, dump it into the dump it into the graduated cylinder, write down the new volume. Weigh the metal, dump it in, new volume. Once you've actually gotten started on this experiment, you literally could finish this section in less than 10 minutes. The calculations will take you longer, the graph will take you longer, but basically it is dump the metal in, tap the air bubbles out, read the volume. I mean, it literally takes a matter of seconds um, to do each measurement once you have it weigh, once you have masses for each of your metal samples. So relatively straightforward, very simple drawing here. Uh, more important, the reason I want you to look at this is these are your reference des your reference densities that you're going to use to determine what your sample actually is. Now, you miss out on some of the comedy of being in the lab because 
one of the samples can only be really described as copper colored. So um, I wonder which one of these it might be. I, I don't have any idea what on that list might be coppery looking. So, occasionally some comedy comes up in labs. This is one of them. It feels kind of stupid sometimes. I go, gee, I wonder what this one is. Um, the others are not so obvious. Um, most, most metals that we work with are silvery to some extent. So, being able to tell some of these from each other is not as obvious. But copper is really freaking obvious. So... It's pretty much the only pure metal sample that looks like that. Okay, second part of the data. Well, this is what the data sheet would look like. This is a sample version. So you're adding, in this case, 30, 20, 22, 13, and 29 grams in different sets, and then you're measuring the volume. So what we need to do, though, as we're going along, is we're making a total of the mass we've added. That's what's going here. Not the individual samples, but the total. So first one was only 30 grams. Then I add another 20, that means 50. Then I add another 22, that means somebody can't add, 72. So these numbers are incorrect. That should be 72, uh, 85, and 104. Um, sorry, 114. Stuff happens, as you can see. Um, and then the volumes are going to be the difference between what we saw and where we started. So we're going to subtract that 25, the original volume reading, from all of these. Graduated cylinder, one decimal place because the marks are on one mils on a 50 gram graduated cylinder. So that means we get our estimation digit is the tenths place, one tenth of a milliliter. So one decimal place all the way down. Masses, um, metal shot are a little too heavy for a milligram balance. It tends to not like heavy samples. So we tend to do this on a centigram balance two decimal places. So again, this should have two decimal places here. This should only be one decimal place here. Um, typos, but you'll, you'll not make the same mistakes. And then we're going to graph that. So those masses versus those volumes in the end, the slope of that is the density. However, very important, the trend line must go through zero. By definition, thou shalt not have mass if you do not have volume and vice versa, it has to go through zero. Not close to zero, not it's got a little bit of leftover. No, it absolutely must go through zero to be valid data. So you have to force that. If you go back to the graphing things I gave you and I'll put the link up, either you force that when you set the trend line, which is what you can do with Excel or with LibreOffice, or you do it as a calculation in the spreadsheet which is what you have to do with open office or uh, Google Sheets. Uh, mobile Excel, you also have to do the calculation because it does not have the force the trend line option the way that the full PC version has. I don't know why, but it doesn't. So um, details are in the videos on how to do the graphs, but it's not that difficult. The slope, if you've done it right, is the actual, uh, is the density. And then you can take that, go back to the table on the previous page, and assign what it is. Um, all right. So here's the blank data sheet. We're providing you the one that actually has the sample data in it because obviously you can't collect your own at the moment. So that will be posted as a separate PDF file. Use that data for this part of the experiment. Okay, part B. Aluminum foil thickness. Now, here we're using an actual rectangular sample of aluminum foil with the idea that two of the dimensions are easy to measure. If I take a, 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 a simple sample of, of aluminum foil, I can use a ruler on the length and the width. I can't use a ruler on the thickness. It's too thin. So the only way I can get the thickness out of this is to actually do a calculation using the existing density. So, mass for a sample like that is easy. We just fold it up so it fits on the balance and weigh it. Easy. Solid weight is easy. Volume here we're going to do by calculation using the rectangular solid. Volume is length times width times height. We're going to use a ruler to give us two of those. And we're going to have a density given from the table and a mass we could easily measure. So we can put those numbers together and we can solve for the missing dimension. You're going to have two sets of data here, two trials. We're going to provide those for you. Take that. Take each of them separately. And then at the end, you average the number. 
All right, so that's the last thing you do here is you average the two thicknesses you calculated from the other two trials. Here's the density of al aluminum that you're going to need to actually solve this. So part A, graph the data, get the density. Part B, do the calculations, get the thickness, and average the two. And then the pre and post lab questions, relatively straightforward. And again, I'll move the links for the graphing stuff. You do not have to use Excel if you don't have it. You can download LibreOffice, which is free, and it will give you the proper trend line, and you can cut and paste the graph onto a new sheet um, to make it look professional. Um, for this lab, you don't have to turn in the graph, but it's not a bad idea to attach it so you can kind of demonstrate you know what you're doing. Uh, normally, I would make you turn it in, but this is anything but a normal situation with our labs right now. So um, what you want from that is the density, and that density should semi-closely match one of the pieces of data in that table because that's the idea is you're supposed to be able to identify the solid based on its density but you absolutely must run that slope run that trend line through zero before you can trust that slope to actually be the density so you have to force the trend line you must force it either by the trend line itself in two of the programs or by um, the, the line est function in the others. This is covered in the videos that I gave you before. You can look at them again. Again, I'll post the links. So, relatively straightforward experiment. This will be due on Sunday the 27th.